All right, so the question of the day, are cordyceps the cause of the next apocalypse? But before we go there, um, I just want to give a brief introduction. My name is Ashley Hagen. I am the scientific and digital editor for ASM, and I also am host of Meet the Microbiologist. And I'm joined by Dr. Michael Schmidt, professor of microbiology and immunology at the University of South Carolina, and also host of This Week in Microbiology. So welcome. Thanks, Michael. everyone. We're happy to be here at Microbe 2023 here in beautiful, albeit hot, Houston. All right, Michael, I know we only have about 30 minutes, so I'm going to pitch you the first question. Um, and I think it's kind of an easy one, but let's see how it goes. Um, you've heard the old adage, feed a fever, starve a cold. Is there any merit to that? And um, I'm particularly interested in whether or not you can sweat out a fever. The answer is, the short answer is no. And you know, we're all microbiologists here, so we know why we develop fever. It's those evil things that our delightful microorganisms make, namely LPS and tychoic and lipotychoic acid, all of which tell that thing in the back of our head, it's time to make fever. And the reason for that is because fever is good. It raises the body's temperature, which affects effectively is a signal that it's no longer hospitable growing us. Also, it, our immune system is detecting that LPS and lipotychoic acid and tychoic acid and sending, send in the troops. So it's sending in TNF and interleukins and we don't feel so hot, but eventually we clear those infections because for over millennia, we didn't have antibiotics, folks, that we could, you know, pop as a pill. You know, we had to rely on ourselves. So if that adage is not correct, what would be the best course of action to bring your fever down? The simple answer is, you know, try to eat healthy. You know, your body is what you put into it. And if you eat healthy, it will effectively supplement your immune system. You know, diet strong in antioxidants all those green leafy vegetables we didn't like to eat as children, all of those things will help our immune system fight the microbes that come in. And recall that most of our microbes are friends and not enemies. It's really the ones that try to invade that really cause us grief. Okay, so continuing with the theme of infectious diseases, the next question is, can gargling with salt water cure a sore throat? Uh, this is another one that any microbiologist should be able to answer with ease. Mm -hmm. What does salt do? It's hypertonic. And so the consequence of that is it's going to change the water coefficient that the microorganisms are normally growing at. And, of course, anyone who has worked in basic microbiology knows about the wonder petri plate Manitol salt sauger. We have high concentrations of salt to recruit staphylococci, and that inhibits all other bacteria. So what we're effectively doing is um, changing the micro niche in our throat by gargling, and the net consequence is you're changing things up. Also, in order to get that salt into solution, we had to use warm water. And that's effectively going to be a vasodilator, which will do what? Help our red blood cells, our white blood cells, increase circulation, increase perfusion, and effectively sweep away the bad actors. Excellent. All right. So moving on, what about, can you get an infection from sitting on a toilet seat? <laughs> uh, the age-old question that my mother warned everyone about. And the answer is perhaps. But the good news is we have something called skin, a remarkable organ that excludes many of the microorganisms. Um, you're more at risk of acquiring the infection from the doorknob or something else that you touch in the built environment. And the built environment is my jam. I, I, I struggle with trying to figure out how to inhibit microorganisms in the built environment to prevent infections. And that's really 
our jam is how to prevent the microbes from attaching to our cells. So remember, after using the restroom today, wash your hands. And I mean really wash your hands. Your Apple Watch will actually tell you if you've done a good job. Mine's always yelling at me that I don't wash long enough. My Apple Watch doesn't tell me about washing You have to turn it on. Is, it an, is there an app for that? No, it's built in. <laughs> really? It's built in. It was part of the, it's part of the I COVID function. Okay. <laughs> wash for 20 seconds. Watch. Yes, That's the awesome. Apple Watch. And it beeps right. and everything. Michael, you're going to have to show me after, after right. this. I'm going get, to uh, get informed. Okay, so same kind of theme, but instead of a toilet seat, what about gym equipment? Oh, yes. An infection from gym equipment. Oh, yes. And again, in, in my gym, uh, you know, the only thing microorganisms love better than plastic are human skin. Mm -hmm. And they really want to attach to us to effectively look at it as a new opportunity for what? Food. And, of course, you can get it from gym equipment, whether it be um, free weights, whether it be one a piece of the equipment, or even the hot tub. Mm. Um, a funny mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. is I teach dental students and graduate students and med students. And just before spring break this year, we had the staphylococcal lecture. And so many of you know where I'm going, hot tub folliculitis. So we give the lecture on hot tub folliculitis to the the dental students and grad students. And one of the grad students came up to me after spring break and he says, you know, Dr. Schmidt, I got hot tub folliculitis. And he took a picture of the rash, showed me the rash, and sure enough, he had it. And I asked him, so did everybody else in the hot tub get it? He said, yeah, you betcha. They all got it. And he said, I knew what it was. And of course, you know, it's simply because there's not enough chlorine in the tub. It, Pseudomonas is very good at dealing with um, interesting nutrients, I think is the polite way of saying it. And it processes them and blooms in the hot tub. So if you're going to jump in a hot tub, make sure it smells like a swimming pool. Good advice. Advice to live by. So what about walking in the house with shoes on? Can that spread illness? And how big of a concern is that? It depends where you stepped. Uh -huh. It depends where of you course. stepped. If you got little toddlers in the house, and we know what toddlers do is they taste everything. And if they're crawling around on the floor, you want to make certain that your floors are clean. Yep. But for the most part, many of us don't find ourselves often on the floor unless we've had a rough night uh, <laughs> writing that grant. and. <laughs> we resorted to something else. And uh, for the most part, you know, just keep your shoes clean. And for some cultures, it's a cultural thing. Um, but for the most part, you don't need to worry about it as long as you haven't stepped in anything. Nice. So this is an ongoing debate that I have with um, family members and myself about salad dressing um, having a longer shelf life than the expiration date. So um, I'm thinking about the vinegar and the ingredients in salad dressing. And the question is, um, can it be kept longer than the expiration date? Uh, the rule of thumb is what sort of salad dressing it is. And literally three weeks ago, my sister-in-law came to visit and we had that discussion. I don't eat ranch uh -huh. and she loves ranch. <laughs> so the last time she visited, I had ranch and it was still in there. Yeah. And <laughs> it was only a couple of months past its expire date. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's just the sell-by date when it's safe mm -hmm. enough to consume. Uh -huh. Generally, the rule of thumb, and it really depends on the aseptic transfer of your family members, how effectively they aseptically transfer that dressing to the food vehicle, whether it be mm -hmm. wings, whether it be lettuce, mm -hmm. you know, so... Teach them aseptic transfer, you know, take off the toothpaste tube and do that. <laughs> but the rule of thumb is one to four months. The vinegar dressings are longer. The mayonnaise base are lesser. Makes sense. All right. How about mushroom coffee? Um, I know that is gaining popularity. Can we talk about that? Does it have more health benefits than regular coffee? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it's, it tastes a little funky. <laughs> and it's not what you think it is. It's, it's not mushrooms. Uh, the mushroom are 
roasted like coffee beans and then they are extracted just like a coffee bean and they're often mixed with um, the coffee itself. So it's sort of like that chicory coffee that we experience when we go to New Orleans. And there are many bioactive agents in mushrooms as a, uh, Chinese medicine has taught us over the years. And it depends on what mushroom is in the coffee. So it's a depends answer. You have to get more chapter and verse. Got it. Okay, so what about cordyceps? Are they the cause of the next apocalypse? The next zombie apocalypse. Yeah. You know, that was a great HBO series, and I was really fascinated by it. If you don't aren't familiar with The Last of Us on HBO, it's about a fungus that is responding to global climate change, and its species predilection jumps from the ants to humans. And the fungus in an ant effectively makes it a zombie. It, it attacks and does all sorts of things. So in the premise of this TV show, the fungus now infects us because we're growing at 37 degrees, and the fungus has now responded to global warming, and it, of course, is reacting to us. And, you know, we're still okay. And I won't spoil the ending, but the ending was a little bit bizarre. I, I don't know how the immune system works that efficiently or inefficiently. So you'll have to watch it to figure out the bad immunology in it. Uh, I'm about halfway through, so I'm glad you're I'm not, not going to spoil yeah, it. Thank you. Keeping the spoiler. Okay, um, how about putting garlic up your nose will clear sinuses? I know there's a TikTok garlic hack, um, if any of you are familiar with this. So is there any merit? This reminds me of going to the dentist and the gag reflex, except Super. instead of in your mouth when they load you up with cotton wads, it's up your nose. And the garlic particle, remember garlic is um, got many bioactive compounds in it, and they actually cause the hypersecretion of mucus. Mm -hmm. And that's effectively what is clearing your sinuses is the garlic is up there. It's an irritant and the mucus is coming in and you're effectively going to flush it out. I mean, I, I have it continuously because of pollen and my nose runs like a drain uh, because of pollen yeah. and the consequences. That's what the garlic clove is doing. It makes for a cute TikTok video. It's really disgusting to watch. <laughs> I mean, they explode out and all the snot comes mm. out. So effective, just disgusting. <laughs> you, yeah, it's, I wouldn't go that far. It's just disgusting. Gross. Just gross. Okay, we are in the lightning round. Um, so these are about 30 seconds or less per answer. We'll see how that goes. Um, First one, we're, a lot of these two are more in the remedy, ancient remedy type um, field. So turmeric, can it be used to treat a cold or flu or virus? Turmeric is a natural antioxidant, so the answer is good. It stimulates our immune system, supplements it. So turmeric is indeed one of those natural remedies with real data. Real data. How about honey? Um, on wounds. Can it help wounds heal faster? It depends on the honey. There's medical grade honey that actually has been harvested from appropriate medicinal fields that then have the active substances in it that will do the trick. And the other thing that honey does is it ties up all the water. Hmm. So when you place it on a wound, it becomes very hygroscopic. And it's effectively dewatering the wound. And of course, remember, all bacteria need water. And that's effectively what it's doing. It's, it's a combination of the both. So that brings me, it's a bit of a tangent. So I'm breaking our 32nd okay. rule. But I remember we talked a little bit about this last year. Um, and so for those of you who didn't hear Microbial Mist 3 is covering a wound. Um, is that an effective way for healing? Because it's going to keep it moist. Or... Um, do you recommend letting it dry out and scab over? It, it depends on the stage of the wound. Okay. And this is sort of getting out of my lane, so mm -hmm. to speak. This is in wound healing, and there's a whole, a specialty, whole specialty of wound healings. I've been working with a burn surgeon, so I've been sort of dropped into the deep end of the pool about the mm -hmm. complexity 
of wound healing and scarring. And ideally, what you want to do is you want to minimize scar tissue development. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it's all about. Okay. How about people with measles should be kept in a dark room during the acute illness to prevent blindness? People with measles should make certain that everyone around them has been vaccinated. <laughs> That's the first rule. The second thing is measles is highly infectious. It's an airborne agent. It will come out and get us. Remember, measles has an R0 or if I have measles, approximately between 12 and 18 of you will come down with it if you haven't been vaccinated. And the, where's Vince Rack and Yellow when I need him? The, um, the virus itself causes these other symptoms and light sensitivity happens to be one of them. So what you're doing by put, placing them in a dark room, you're effectively offering an analgesic, so to speak, uh, so that they're not aggravated by the light. Okay. So treating symptoms. You're treating case. symptoms. Got it. Not the disease. Got it. Okay. How about rubbing Ray and Nephew, which is a type of rum, on your chest will ease congestion? In South Carolina, we refer to that as moonshine. <laughs> so we're talking 120 to 180 proof alcohol. So what do you all think alcohol does at that proof? It effectively evaporates. And as it evaporates, it, it effectively is increasing circulation, mm -hmm. which will help clear the congestion. Also, your immune system comes in with those evil things, the white blood cells, that will effectively dispatch whether it be bacterial mucus causing things mm -hmm. or the evil viruses. Right. Okay, here's another one that I think is kind of gross, uh, but sleeping with onions in your socks will this, cure a cold. Uh, no. <laughs> the, this is another disgusting one. This is <laughs> the so 30 gross. seconds. It's, it's so gross. disgusting. <laughs> uh, I think it's, again, another irritant. <laughs> yeah. That has no effect. <laughs> As, no. Okay. How about um, applying honey to a bee sting or vinegar to, for a wasp sting? I've, these are different myths that I found. So, And again, we have to ask what's happening. What you're doing is you're trying to address the issue of the venom. And yeah, honey, right. if it's medical grade honey, yep. has the right stuff in it to be anti-inflammatory and address it that way. In the case of vinegar, it's pH. Uh, the pH is going to effectively interact with the venom if it's in that local area and hasn't moved away and, in and inactivated. And we all know the solution to pollution is dilution. And mm -hmm. so that's effectively what the uh, vinegar is doing for us in that instance. So if we're talking about pH, then I um, walked into a yellow jacket's nest a few years back, and um, someone told me to pour bleach on the stings. Uh, is that, is there any merit to that? Uh, I was very hesitant, neat, by the way. Neat bleach? <laughs> neat bleach is, neat bleach. A, you know, if you buy bleach at the grocery yeah. store, it's about 6.5% sodium hypochlorite. And just for, you know, fun, just pour it on your finger one time and watch your skin <laughs> blanch, <laughs> literally blanch. Yes. Well, straight up bleach is not good. It's damaging to the mm -hmm. skin. It's dehydrative. Mm -hmm. It's really bad. Yeah. And so, no. So, no. <laughs> no. So, it's a good thing I push back on that. <laughs> push back on that. <laughs> Great. Okay. How about dandelion milk can cure warts? Um, stick with the acyclovir. Stick with the, <laughs> a, you know, a, yeah. it's, you know, it's HPV. It's human papillomavirus, not the one we get. We have a great vaccine for that prevents uh, cervical cancer. But I think what the dandelion uh, sap is doing is it's serving as an irritant. Uh. And the irritant is effectively just recruiting our immune system to effectively treat it. Remember, the skin is way up on top, and normally you don't have too many white blood cells coming in to trim things up. And so it's serving as an irritant, that milk sap from the dandelion. That makes sense. Okay, how about applying fingernail polish to ringworm suffocates the fungus? 
uh, it'll just keep it there uh, from <laughs> prevent it from moving. Remember, you know, ringworm is nothing more than a dermatophyte fungus. And fungi can do all sorts of remarkable things. So the get yourself an over-the-counter antifungal cream that you can buy at any of your favorite drugstores, and that's better to deal with it. The other thing you may want to pick up next time you're at Walmart is one of those ultraviolet flashlights like they use at bars to see if your ID is legit. And you can actually shine it on your head it can, if you don't have a woods lamp handy, which is code for black light from, and now I'm dating myself because black light was popular during the disco era. And so you can actually see where the ringworm is growing on your head. It's, it's a God-fearing fungus. It's disturbing. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and number 20, a poultice made from instant coffee and water applied to a cold sore many times, or this is complicated remedy, remedy through, will kill the wart, or kill the herpes virus, I'm sorry, and prevent cold sores in the future. Again, stick with the acyclovir ointments that are out there. They're easy to find. Your physician immediately sees it. He'll immediately know what it is. And don't stay away from the voodoo. Go with the great antiviral. Remember, these antivirals are typically nucleoside analogs that have been adapted specifically for the life cycle of the virus. And again, where's Vince Racaniello when I need him? He's on an airplane coming for TWIV and TWIM. All right. Well, that was 20 questions in about 22 minutes. So thank you so much. Well, Mike. let's take oh, some questions the from the yeah, audience. Exactly. If anyone has any myths they would like to address. Let us know. How about the being in cold weather makes you ill? Well, this is a microbiology meeting. You should know the answer to that. And the answer is no. Bacterial viruses, fungi are what causes us to become ill. It, it's the only thing that, you know, standing out in the rain, in a cold rain does, is it, you know, attacks your immune system as you're beginning to to try to address it. So it's immune stress that is likely doing you in. And we know that stress is really not good for us. And wellness is, is a big trend now. And so anytime you can get stress out of your life, um, that's really good because it fosters immune health. Ray's gonna, you got a flu virus They're a little out light. of that. Yeah, you got a flu virus. <laughs> Other questions. All right. Hi there. Um, so this myth is somewhat uh, twofold. Uh, there's this myth I've heard that urine is supposedly sterile. And I've also heard along with that, that I guess if you felt compelled to for some reason that because it's sterile, it's safe to drink. Um, how would you address these myths? <laughs> uh, again, any of our clinical microbiologists here who have worked on the urine bench know that urine is not sterile. Urine, ha you know, it looks optically clear up to 100,000 bacteria per milliliter. Now, we all know that 100,000 E. coli is effectively the infectious dose. So, do you want to drink E. coli? <laughs> There's one behind you. Putting hot water on a stingray sting or vinegar on a jellyfish bite? Well, again, it's the venom. You're addressing the venom. In the case of the hot water, what you're doing is you're increasing circulation. So if you do indeed have any antibody memory that's still circulating in your system, the antibodies can get to the site of the, the venom attack. And the vinegar is, of course, going to change the local pH and if the venom hasn't been delivered to your circulatory system, it's effectively going to change its pH, coagulate it, change its structure to effectively lessen its activity. Thank you. One more question. Oh, yeah. oh I see like three or four. Oh. <laughs> Thoughts on an apple day keeps the doctors away. Ooh. Fiber is good. 
and it, it really helps the transit of the microbes through your colon. It's chock a flock full of vitamins and nutrients, but in reality, it's the fiber. And that fiber actually helps the microbiome in the transverse colon keep the evil clostridia from effectively making carcinogenic compounds across the transverse colon that are bad. And, you know, that's effectively when they stick that delightful hose up your butt once you turn 45, when you go in for your colonoscopy, that's what they're looking for, is those polyps and precancerous and even cancerous lesions because you didn't eat an apple a day. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for being here today. And Michael, thank you so much for these wonderful and insightful answers and helping us debunk some of these myths. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your meeting um, and we'll see you around. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.